statewide. Small Business Boot Camp is designed for small businesses to return very strong after COVID. Um, it's a statewide initiative with our community partners. Uh, we have defined this as a six week boot camp. It looks like we are going to extend that through the month of June. More information will be following up on that. All of these boot camps will be recorded and put up on our website, azcommerce.com forward slash COVID. We also have a resource collective that we're pulling together resources for all of our small businesses amongst all of the other resources that are on the ACA website. Uh, this week we've got great uh, sessions covered. This is our fourth week uh, of the boot camp. Uh, we're awfully excited to have a number of activities. Today we're going to have managing your workforce during the reopening. This is a super important topic. We have a great guest speaker for that today. Uh, tomorrow, revamping your business for post-COVID. And on Wednesday, navigating your workplace. So these are all about returning to work. And then also uh, we're continuing on Thursday, our Safety Thursday with safety in the workplace. We have a 9 a.m. and a 3 p.m. session on safety in the workplace, uh, sponsored by the Arizona um, chapter for the National Safety Council. And then we're continuing our Fridays to focus on marketing. We had a great guest panel on marketing on Friday, and we'll continue that this Friday as well. We'd also like to keep you updated on new uh, SBA and other uh, inform informative uh, releases that came out. And for that, I'm gonna ask Robert Theobald, our Vice President of Small Business at the ACA to give us a quick update. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, so as of Saturday, May 16th, there was still 114 billion remaining in the PPP uh, fund uh, for loans. So again, if you're still waiting for your lender to get with you, you may need to, to look at another lender that can process that while there's still funds there. Uh, but uh, it looks like that pool is decreasing by about a billion a day. It's just slowed down from the, the huge numbers that were just, you know, being used up uh, earlier on. Um, however, I uh, definitely want to get you in and get your PPP loans. Um, just the, the, the second point there is just a note from round one and two, the, the huge impact that it's had on Arizona and the businesses bringing in $8 billion of uh, PPP loans into the state to help our businesses. A big key uh, update uh, from late Friday and through the weekend is the SBA has released the PPP loan forgiveness application and instructions. Uh, include the link there and uh, when the slide deck is posted to our website, you'll be able to click on that link to see that information. We will be doing a, a more focused boot camp session on Tuesday, May 26th, uh, to talk more in detail about the loan forgiveness application instructions. Um, so I want to give you a heads up about that. Back to you, Andy. Thank you, Robert. Great update. Oops, sorry about that. Looks like I lost my uh, presentation. There we go. Thank you. Um, also wanted to call your attention to other resources that are on our site and other sites. The SBDC sites are fantastic, as well as Arizona at Work, and also our MEP program looking to assist manufacturers. Also a great resource is Arizona Together. Um, that's arizonatogether.org. Um, which also has a collection of many, many links and donation uh, capabilities and information resources. We're also putting together guides. Uh, those guides will be launched on our resource collective, azcommerce.com forward slash COVID. So please do stay informed, use those resources, and we'd like to hear from you if uh, there's any other topics or information that is required uh, for your successful return. Uh, with that, I um, want to also reiterate, all of this will be recorded. Uh, we'll be posting this up as well as the information being provided. Um, today's speakers, I would like to uh, introduce Travis Pachenko and Tom Fulcher. Uh, Travis is with Fenmore Craig. We're going to be dealing with some labor and employment issues in, in law uh, regarding the return to COVID. And uh, Tom will be on hand to answer any specific CARES Act uh, questions along with Robert. So. Without further ado, please take it away, Travis. Okay. Just get my screen up here. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I uh, appreciate you inviting me to speak today. And, and uh, we're going to be discussing some important issues 
Uh, before we get that, again, my name is Travis Pacheco. I'm a labor and employment lawyer for the uh, Phoenix office of Fenimore Craig. I help employers of all sizes, small, medium, large, uh, navigate the comprehensive set of state and federal employment laws. I, I draft and enforce employment agreements, everything from you know, not, you know, restrictive covenants, non-competes, um, uh, and severance agreements, those type of things. I defend employers with respect to claims, discrimination claims, and, and, and uh, whistleblower type claims. Um, again, we have a lot to cover. I'm going to try to breeze through a lot of uh, this content. I'm going to also offer the slides uh, that, that Mark can post. So if there's something in there that you want to see later, you can go back and refer to it. Today we're going to be speaking about HR and personnel considerations for reopening and returning to the workspace. Uh, here's the obligatory disclaimer. The PowerPoint presentation does not constitute legal advice. Uh, to obtain legal advice regarding your particular factual scenario, you want to contact either a Fenimore Craig uh, attorney or legal counsel to the extent you already have one. Today, uh, just to give you a brief overview, um, we're going to talk about the uh, governor's recent executive order, effective May 16th. Um, employer best practices for rehiring employees and maintaining a healthy workplace during the pandemic, responding to an employee or employees who test positive for COVID-19. And then I'm gonna end with a brief primer on the new federal emergency paid leave requirements. It's really important that all employers know what these requirements are and what employee rights are and employer obligations with respect to these uh, new paid leave requirements. Governor's, uh, Governor Ducey's stay-at-home order expired on May 15th. It was replaced by the new executive order called Stay Healthy, Return Smarter, Return Stronger. That executive order was the 36th exec executive order of 2020, and it, it was effective May 16th. Um, it follows the White House staging guidelines. Uh, in particular, they talked about vulnerable individuals need to continue to uh, shelter at home, take reasonable steps to uh, limit the amount of time they're outside of their residence. But with respect to businesses, it's a policy that promotes physical distancing while encouraging social connectedness and allows businesses to gradually and safely open in compliance with federal guidelines as the state continues to mitigate and prevent the spread of COVID-19. So any employer that needs to comply with, with these requirements. This is, uh, I just uh, highlighted for you some language that's in the executive order all employers shall develop, establish, and implement policies based on CDC guidelines, OSHA, and Arizona Department of Health Services to limit and mitigate the spread of COVID-19, including the following. And we're going to talk more about some of these uh, on this list here shortly, but uh, briefly, promoting healthy hygiene practices, intensifying cleaning, disinfection, and ventilation practices in the workplace, monitoring for sickness, ensuring physical distancing, providing necessary protective equipment, allowing for and encouraging teleworking or remote work where feasible, providing plans where possible to return to work in phases, and lastly, limiting the congregation of groups of no more than 10 persons when feasible and in relation to the size of the location. So all employers must comply with these um, guidelines here. There are industry specific guidelines for reopening in Arizona that may or may not apply to you, but to the extent they do, they are listed here. Uh, Governor Ducey's office and the Arizona Department of Health Services have issued this specific industry guidelines for uh, industries such as retail, uh, churches, theaters, casinos, uh, restaurants. So to the extent this may apply to you, I would highly encourage you to, to visit the website link that is here listed on the uh, slide presentation. I know that the uh, Arizona Commerce Authority, they also just listed a bunch of specific industry guidelines that they also posted on their website. Let's talk about federal OSHA, which is in the state equivalent would be ADOSH here in Arizona, uh, but it's, it's creating a safe workplace. And, and so I tell a lot of employers when I'm advising clients or employers that all employers have a general duty under OSHA to maintain a workplace that is free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to employees. So you have that general duty. And, and OSHA, which was, an, which was enacted in 1970, it has these general regulations, but it also has specific regulations regarding specific industries. And, and so for some employers, they have, to, you know, they have to comply with those specific regulations regarding their industry, construction, for example. But a lot of employers don't have that specific uh, 
industry regulations by OSHA, but they do have the general duty and general obligations to maintain a safe and healthy workplace. And what that means during COVID-19 might be different. And, and what it means typically is you should be following CDC guidelines with, with respect to reopening businesses, follow the uh, uh, Arizona Department of Health Services guidelines. And those are ways that you can meet this general duty uh, to, to comply and to provide a safe and healthy workplace. So keep that in mind. That's, that's the overview here is you need to, to, to keep a safe and healthy workplace and you have that duty to do so. The Department of uh, OSHA recommends that businesses develop an infectious disease preparedness and response plan. And, and there's a link here to that publication. Um, I'll talk about it in a little more detail, but it's a tiered approach to determine potential workplace exposure and provides recommendations based on that exposure. So it tiers it between a very low level risk and a risk is coming into contact with someone who has COVID-19 to a very high healthcare workers, people in the hospitals that are gonna be coming into contact on, on a regular basis with those who have COVID-19. And so in the guidance and in, in, in the OSHA recommendations, they talk about what would be required based on the level of risk. OSHA also, let me just go back here, OSHA also offers industry specific guidance and they've provided a number of alerts over the last several weeks for different industries such as construction, meat packing, manufacturing, rideshare and taxi, package delivery and other industries. And this website link here provides those alerts. They're all pretty similar, but some are, are specific to the industry. So you wanna take a look at that to the extent you are in there. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, bringing employees back to work. Uh, let's talk about that real quick. It's important to develop a neutral system for choosing which employees to rehire or return to work from a layoff or furlough. So this is if you're not fully operational, you're bringing employees back and maybe in stages or thinking about doing so, you wanna make sure that you develop a neutral system for choosing who to bring back and when. Um, you can don't do it based on uh, particular employees because you're going to get yourself into trouble with some discriminatory type claims. Um, some criteria could be based on seniority with the company, uh, past performance reviews or skills that are needed or any other objective criteria. Uh, don't base rehiring decisions on perceived higher risk of COVID-19 complications. So don't make assumptions about who wants to uh, come back to work, who shouldn't come back to work, this person is uh, one of our elderly workers and we don't want them to come back to work right now. You don't wanna make that, those decisions based on that. You wanna let that, the, the, those persons who maybe are vulnerable raise the issue with you and they make the decision whether to come back. I wanna talk briefly about the best practices for creating a safe work environment. It's important that employers implement social distancing for employees and customers, including offering telework options where available. You want to consider PPE for your employees and I'll, I'll go into detail about uh, some PPE and what that is and distinctions so that you're knowledgeable and, and know what those are when they come up. Sanitize and disinfect the office regularly. Take temperatures or engage in other screening measures where appropriate. Limit business travel. Encourage employees who are sick to stay home. That's an important one. You want to separate sick employees. Those who have symptoms, you want to get them out of the works workspace and make sure that they're not um, uh, infecting other employees and then have a plan for minimizing risk. Let's talk about social distancing in the workplace. How can businesses do social distancing effectively? Well, here's some ideas and, and guidance. Encourage teleworking for number one. If, if your operations allow for remote work and, and the business can afford to do that, you need to, to, to encourage that during this time, I think it's important that you limit the number of people in the workplace. Those in the workplace, you wanna arrange workstations at least six feet apart to provide that social distancing. You may wanna, if, if workers are in cubicles, they don't have private offices, you wanna assess the walls or the cubicle heights, see if those need to be extended um, and, and addressed in the workplace or separated. You wanna close common areas to discourage gatherings for the time being. And, and for small areas such as small conference rooms or lounges, you want to close those or strictly limit access to those small areas to, again, avoid uh, congregations of, of employees. 
uh, stagger start times is one way to uh, to be able to you know everybody coming in at nine o'clock is probably not the best thing. If you're able to have a more flexible schedule, that's that's encouraged. And then bringing employees back in phases as the reopening process continues. That's that's another way of, of limiting the number of employees in one place at one time. Best practices will also depend on your particular industry. So you want to be aware of the applicable guidance that discussed before the state and federal level provides industry specific guidance on a regular basis. So you want to keep abreast of those changes as well. Let's talk about maintaining a healthy work environment. Um, you want to continue to, again, encourage sick employees to stay home. Clusters of infected empl of employees at the workplace may require shutting down your business. Uh, that, that's in the last resort type category. I mean, we're talking about if you have a number of infected employees at your workplace, you, you may want to consider uh, shutting down uh, for a period of time, doing a deep clean, having those employees uh, quarantine, and anybody in close contact with those employees uh, quarantine. Emergency paid sick leave is designed to help provide compensation to sick employees who stay at home for a variety of COVID-19 related reasons. I wanna, I'm gonna talk about that at the end of my presentation today about that paid sick leave. And then consider improving the engineering controls using the building ventilation system. You wanna to talk to your HVAC companies to see how you can do that. There's, you know, it may include increasing ventilation rates ensuring ventilation systems operate properly and increasing outdoor air ventilation. The CDC also provides more um, suggestions and guidelines with respect to ventilation systems at that link that's listed here in the slide. Uh, and give employees, customers and visitors what they need to clean their hands and cover their coughs and sneezes. That's an important one. You have to have the supplies. If you're gonna have open business, you need to make sure that you have enough uh, sanitation supplies. Personal protective equipment, PPE, that, that term is often kind of thrown around and used very loosely by, uh, by employers, also by the media. Um, I want to tell you what PPE is because it's important that there is a definition in the OSHA regulations and other equivalent regulation. PPE is, uh, is commonly, for COVID-19 reasons, it commonly consists of respirators like an N95 or a K95 mask. That's this picture in the slideshow, this woman wearing the mask here, that's probably a N95 mask. It's, it's considered a respirator. Um, it, a PPE all can, it, with respect to COVID-19 might, might include gowns, shields, uh, surgical masks, or disposable gloves. But PPE generally, it depends on the uh, industry you're in. There's certain industries in the healthcare or in labs that they require certain protective equipment by regulation. And the employers in those industries must provide training. They must uh, regularly inspect that uh, PPE. Um, they, they must uh, provide and pay for that PPE for their employees. So uh, face coverings, which I'll get to now, is distinguished between masks and respirators and face covering. So a mask is usually defined by OSHA as either a filtering respirator, such as an N95 or K95 or specialized medical grade surgical mask, these type of masks, uh, according to the, e the CDC and OSHA, they should be reserved for healthcare providers, uh, first responders and essential workers that are required by OSHA to wear their respiratory prote protection under the regulations. Uh, due to uh, the low supply of such masks, that's why they're making um, those, they recommend, recommended that you reserve those types. That doesn't mean that no employees in your office can wear them. If they have them, they can wear them if you allow them to do so. A face covering though is different. A face covering is a cloth or a bandana that covers the mouth and nose. OSHA has not stated where a face covering is truly PPE. The CDC though has listed criteria. If you're gonna require or allow uh, employees to wear face coverings in the office, there's certain criteria that, that should be met. It, the face covering should fit snugly, but comfortably against the side of the face. It should be secured with ties or ear loops it should include multiple layers of fabric, allow for breathing without restriction, and be able to be laundered and machine dried without damage or change to shape. PPE at work. In Arizona, if you're not in the industry where OSHA requires the use of PPE, you may require it in the workplace. Some states and municipalities are requiring masks or face coverings at work, so be aware of this if you operate outside of Arizona. Many of Arizona's reopening guidelines encourage or require face coverings or other forms of PPE at work. 
And OSHA recommends PPE, but cautions that while correctly using PPE can help prevent some exposures, it should not take the place of other prevention strategies. So uh, the employer may, may require or permit PPE, but that's not gonna be the only thing they need to do in order to create a safe and healthy work environment. And then PPE should be appropriate to the level of risk, properly fitted, used consistently, regularly inspected and clean. Give me a minute, I wanted to make sure I, I was still online. I got a signal that I may have been cut off for a second. So let me go ahead and go back to my screen. Okay, so PP at, at work. The first step is to assess the risk. To determine the type of PPE appropriate for your workplace, you need to assess the hazard to your business. And it depends on the industry you're in. So OSHA has a guide listed here on the website. It's a link to a publication that you can, that will help assist, assist you in assessing the risk. Most employers will follow, fall under the lower to medium risk. Uh, the, the very high, and here's the, the, uh, the range here. It goes from lower to very high. So very high would be healthcare workers and lab personnel, de death care workers. And to the lower category would be workers who doesn't, we do not, not regularly come into contact with those in the public. The medium would be workers who requires uh, frequent or close contact with those in the public. That would be like cashiers at the grocery store or those uh, in the customer service business who are frequently, that's part of their job to be coming into contact with the public. So depending on the level of risk that, that PP, certain PPE may be required or uh, recommended. Determine the appropriate level. So step two is, is after you've assessed the risk, then you determine the appropriate level of PPE. So for if you're in the lower risk category, PPE is not required, okay? If you're not coming into regular contact with the public, it's not required at work. According to OSHA, PPE in the medium exposure risk category, PPE, not respirators, maybe face coverings, maybe gloves, those type of things is recommended for the medium risk group. So that might be a surgical mask or like I said, a cloth face covering. If, if you require PPE in the workplace, you gotta make sure you enforce the rules and have a uniform policy in place regarding appropriate types of PPE, how to care for it, how to wear it, and consequences for failing to wear PPE. This is something that should probably be in writing and distributed to employees through either a, a employment policy handbook or through a memo, an intercompany memo. And, uh, you can ask your legal counsel to assist you with that to the extent you're going to require PPE in the workplace. Employers must also provide training on how to appropriately use or wear PPE. Now I'm talking about if it's required by the employer. Um, so if it's required, then you should provide training on how to use it. OSHA and CDC's website have videos and tutorials about how to properly wear and maintain various types of PPE. And if employers require the use of PPE at work, including face coverings, employers typically must pay for it. Now, what happens if an employee refuses to wear PPE at work when you have a policy requiring? Well, they can be sent home for doing so. If they are refusing to comply with company policies and you as a business owner believe that PPE is required at work to maintain the self uh, or warranted uh, to maintain a safe and healthy work environment, they can be sent home, but before you just go ahead and say, hey, they're, they're just simply refusing to do it or being insubordinate, you wanna ask the employee why they're refusing. Perhaps it's because they have a skin allergy and they cannot wear a mask on their face, or maybe they have breathing problems or a, a breathing condition that wearing a mask on their face doesn't allow them, I mean, it makes them feel suffocated or, or increase their breathing problems. So you wanna find out why, and, and if they do have something like that or a a, a, a reason, a legitimate reason for refusing to wear the PPE. Um, you'll want to try to find an accommodation for them or an alternative. The EEOC, which they, they regulate a Title VII uh, discrimination type claims and Americans with Disability Act, uh, and they enforce those, those uh, laws, they say that the employer should discuss the request and provide the modification or an alternative if feasible and does not present an undue hardship on the operation of the employer's business under the ADA and Title VII. So you'll make, you want to make sure you have that discussion with the employee who's refusing to wear the PPE in order to make sure you're checking all your boxes, making sure there's 
not something else you're missing why they're refusing before you just send them home or terminate them. Can you require customers to use PPE? Yes, you can. Much of Arizona's reopening guidance encourages face coverings for customers. If you have a PPE requirement, make sure it's posted prominently on the outside of your business or at the, at the entrance of your business and uniformly enforced for all customers. Um, you can have recommendations and not requirements too. So you want to, you can recommend that customers wear face coverings if you, if you don't want to take that staunch approach as requiring. But it depends on the industry you're in. It may, it may be uh, something that you should require customers to wear at least a face covering. You should also encourage other forms of protect, protection such as low contact methods and social distancing in your workplace with respect to customers. You might want to consider making disposable masks, gloves, and sanitizing wipes available to customers and, con and continue to look at the CDC and, and state and local guidance with respect to this because this is a, a that's constantly changing um, and so you want to keep abreast of any updates. Cleaning and disinfecting, I'm going to go through this very briefly, but it's very important that uh, you're increasing cleaning and disinfecting in the workplace, performing routine environmental cleaning and concentrating on those high touch surfaces such as counters, door tops, drawers and cabinets and handles. Employees who are doing the cleaning should use disposable gloves when cleaning. You want to clean with soap and water first and then use a disinfectant. Um, employers want to educate and encourage proper hand washing. You got 20 seconds of, of hand washing with soap and the use of hand sanitizer. Ensure that employees have, again, enough supplies in the workplace that they can actually wash their hands and use hand sanitizer. Um, you want to encourage proper cough and sneeze etiquette, coughing into your elbow, um, disposal of tissues, you know, make sure there's enough trash receptacles, garbage cans around that they can dispose of these things. The CDC has also issued reopening cleaning guidance at that link that's listed on the slide. So you want to take a look at that with respect to uh, disinfectants and cleaners that can be used by employers. I want to talk briefly about some screening measures in the workplace. One is temperature checks. We get a lot of questions. Can we take our employees temperature? Can we require uh, employee, employees to undergo temperature checks? Yes, you can. Normally, it, this would be considered a medical examination under the Americans with Disabilities Act or equivalent state law. And under the, those laws, you cannot perform a medical examination of an employee at work uh, there's very limited circumstances what there needs to be a, an immediate threat to the safety of the employee or other employees um, in order to have that medical examination or, or require. But the, the EEOC has expressly stated that during a pandemic, because this is now considered a pandemic, this is, employers will not run afoul or violate the Americans with Disabilities Act by uh, requiring temperature checks. Uh, best practices for conducting temperature checks. Uh, they should be conducted before the employee enters the workplace. If you're, if you're already doing it when the employee enters the workplace, you have already increased risk of exposure to the extent that they are infected with COVID-19. So you need to do this outside of the workplace or an area before entering the major area of the workplace. And you can do it through, if you have various entrances, in order to uh, promote social distancing and people not waiting in lines or uh, those waiting next to each other to get their temperature checked, they can, uh, you can put people at different entrance points to do those temperature checks if you want. So employees should be informed that the temperature is taken to assess symptoms only. It's not to diagnose them medically. It's only to see if they have a temperature. The EEOC also cautions that not all people with COVID-19 have a fever and not all people with a fever have COVID-19. So temperature checks is just one method of, of creating a safe work environment, or at least trying to do so. It's not the end all be all for, for doing that though. It's important that um, the temperature checks and any questions you ask remain confidential between the person performing that screening and the employee. So any information collected should be kept in a secure confidential location separate from the regular file for each individual. So if you are writing down or, or you have a log that needs to be, make sure that it's kept confidential. The person taking temperatures is very important, should wear PPE because now they are coming in contact and getting close within uh, six feet of, of an employee or others, customers or whatever it is. They're getting close enough where now they are, the increased uh, risk of getting COVID-19 has gone up. So uh, 
you need to make sure that they are wearing proper PPE. That, that would probably be at least a, a face covering or a respirator, gloves, and anything else that the CDC or local county uh, health departments recommend for people who are taking temperatures. The thermometer used should be a no-touch thermometer. So one that you don't have to actually put it up against someone's forehead or, uh, and you can get these at a variety of locations online as well. And you need to set a temperature screening threshold over which employees will not be allowed to enter the workplace. The CDC typically recommends 100 to 100.4 degrees um, is, is the range where a lot of businesses use. That's the threshold. So if someone has a temperature at that range or above, they should be sent home. Um, and, 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 but you should set that screening threshold ahead of time and notify employees uh, prior to these screening methods being instituted. And you can do that through a, a memo, internal memo that's emailed to employees. Hey, on Monday, we're gonna start you know, doing temperature screenings or whatever that is. You should at least notify employees that you're gonna be doing, doing that. For non-exempt hourly employees, businesses should plan to pay those employees for any time they spend waiting in line. I mean, they're, if, they're, if they're spending time waiting, they're here at work, they're not doing their own thing, they should be paid for that time. In addition to temperature checks, or maybe alternatively, employers may, don't have to do temperature checks, they can. And if they do that, or alternatively to do that, they, they can also do screening certifications, daily screening certifications before entering the workplace. And employees must fill out a form saying they don't feel the symptoms, they're not feeling sick, they have no household members uh, who are having COVID-19 symptoms, and that they took their temperature that morning and they did not have a temperature at 100 or 100.4 or over. That's an alternative. If, if you don't want to do the, the uh, temperature readings, that might be at a minimum what you could do on a daily basis uh, for those. Any screening method should be uniformly applied to all employees and performed consistently. You want to stay away from discrimination type claims. You can't just temperature check, you know, one out of every three people. If you're going to do it, you got to do it to everybody who's walking in, in your work site. Employers may also test for COVID-19, and some employers are, are, are testing for that, uh, some larger employers. Um, and, and so that's allowed under the ADA uh, per EEOC guidance as well. You, you can do that, um, although there may not be enough tests available. Vulnerable employees. Uh, CDC and other COVID-19 guidance provides that older employees are more vulnerable to COVID-19, and it's recommended that they stay home. Should I exclude them from the first group of employees that are brought off layoff or furlough? We kind of talked about this already. You shouldn't do that. And the reason why is you would likely violate the Age Discrimination and Employment Act with respect to older employees or uh, equivalent state law. Those employees who are vulnerable, they need to be the ones to raise the issue with you. And, and, and they may say, hey, I, I'm not ready to come back to work because of A, B, and C. You would have that discussion with them, provide them options. And, and, and do it that way. Don't make assumptions and, and, and try to protect vulnerable employees um, when they're not asking for such protection. What do I do if an employee tests positive for COVID-19? So you, you open your doors, all, all employees are back to work or staging has occurred. And now all of a sudden find out someone, one of the employees has test positive for COVID-19. The first reaction sometimes is to go, oh, this is liability for me. I need to, I need to scramble and talk to other employees. And the first thing you need to do is, is offer support, take a step back, express sympathy to that infected employee. They're going through a lot right now. They have their own concerns and anxieties, and you need to address that with them. Say, hey, we're, we're here uh, for you. Let us know what we can do. You want to make sure, obviously, that they're not coming to work, that they're self-quarantining, that they're going to do for a period of at least 14 days or until symptoms have uh, completely resolved. Um, you want to notify the employee of availability of emergency paid sick leave and other paid leave that may, may be available to them. Then you want to contact trace. You want to ask the infective employee what employees he or she has been in close contact with for a prolonged period of time over the prior two weeks. Close contact, the CDC says, is within six feet. So if there's, if, if employees are working together in close contact for a prolonged period of time, you need to find out who, the, who those are. You may already know who those employees are if, if they're in cubicles and you, you can see how they are, but you still need to talk to the employee to make sure you're not missing 
uh, individuals who have been working closely with that infected employee. You then want to notify coworkers of potential exposure. And this is per the CDC guidance. You need to, you need to notify coworkers um, if they've been working closely with that infected employee. You require that they self-assess for symptoms and then direct them to their own healthcare providers. Uh, don't be giving them medical advice. Just say you need, you know, you should contact your medical provider. Um, those em employees, you know, need to self-quarantine for 14 days. Those who have worked closely in contact with the infected employee, they should also be quarantined for 14 days, not continue to come into work. Um, this needs to be done in a confidential manner, and you cannot identify the infected person. That's very important. It might be obvious to the coworkers who it is, but you cannot identify the infected person. There's privacy laws, there's ADA, there's all kinds of restrictions against um, identifying the infected person. So um, there's prohibitions against disclosing medical information of, of employees to other employees. So that's important that that be done, even though practically speaking, coworkers are, may know who, who the infected person is. You wanna speak with individuals who had close contact and, and, and there's, there's a, a little bit of a distinction here with non-essential business employees. HR or, a, or a authorized supervisor of the company can speak with the uh, coworkers. If this is a non-essential business type worker, the employee, again, they, they must require those coworkers to self-isolate for 14 days. That's per the CDC guidance. The Maricopa County Health Department talks about essential workers or essential business employees that an HR or supervisor can, can meet with that individual. The individual may still work as long as no sim, they have no symptoms of COVID-19 and there needs to be good monitoring in place. So this is if a first responder, for instance, comes in close contact with someone who has COVID-19, another a coworker or a, a, a healthcare worker, they're, they're essential workers. They're not having any uh, symptoms for those type businesses and employees. Uh, there is a little bit of a distinction. Consider notifying your entire workforce because there's rumors that spread quickly. There's somebody that has COVID-19 here. If you don't get a hold of that pretty quickly, you may have uh, absenteeism problems with a number of other employees not showing up because they're scared of what's happening. So if an employee uh, discloses that they've, they've got COVID-19, you first take those initial steps we discussed. And then you also want to take, consider notifying your entire workforce. You can do that through I'd recommend through pro probably a, a written notice to the company, email to everybody or provided, uh, distributed otherwise. Um, and you can work with legal counsel on, on how to communicate that effectively. It's very important that that's, that notice does not scare people that you, you employers say, hey, these, somebody has been infected in the workplace. You don't identify who it is. We're taking these steps to ensure and, and try to maintain a, self, a safe and healthy workplace and then Identify the steps you're taking, your deep cleaning, whatever you're doing, uh, that, that maybe you're creating social distancing. The, the infected employee has not, has been removed from the work site, work place and quarantine. Just reassuring employees that it's safe to come to work. Uh, you wanna maybe notify others, customers, clients or vendors with whom the infected employee had close contact for a prolonged period of time. This is not required, but if, the, if you know the employee had been working with a particular customer or vendor, um, you should notify that, that, that uh, customer or vendor uh, that the employee has been infected. And, and you also maybe want to work with legal counsel on uh, drafting a notice and providing that notice to the customer. At least if you could have a phone call with the customer or vendor and then follow up with the, with the notice in writing so that you have something to the extent that there's some type of liability claim later that you've provided notice of, of this. And then finally, clean and disinfect the workspace. Just because it's at the end of the list doesn't mean it goes in that chronology necessarily, but you obviously want to get on top of the cleaning and disinfecting. You want to deep clean the infected employee's work area at a minimum and then, and then uh, appropriately clean the entire uh, office if you can. So um, those are, those are recommend, recommendations if someone has COVID-19. Obviously, if you have a, a cluster of employees that become infected, um, that might be a time where you close, but you don't need to close if it's just one or a small group of employees who become uh, infected with COVID-19. 
over a particular amount of time. Now, if you have a small work site and you only have eight employees in a very small area and three or four of them become infected, that might be a time to close and do a deep clean and quarantine. And, uh, but otherwise, if you have a, a relatively larger work site and it's only one person who comes down with it, you don't have to close. You just have to take the proper precautions that we discussed and then follow routine cleaning procedures. Do I have to report the employee who has uh, COVID-19 to OSHA? Well, so COVID-19 is a qualified illness that may trigger OSHA reporting requirements for employers, but it depends on the situation. So outside of the healthcare industry, emergency responders, correctional institutions, employers are required to report COVID-19 cases only if there's objective evidence that a COVID-19 case may be work-related. That means that the employee you have evidence, the employer has evidence that the em employee caught COVID-19 at the workplace, okay? Or has a good reason to believe that they, they, they became infected because of the work-related conditions. So this might be because there's a cluster of cases and there's no other explanation of how the employee uh, was infected by COVID-19. And the evidence is available to employers. So only in those specific situations it may it have to be reported to OSHA. Normally, OSHA reporting requirements, generally speaking, uh, does not apply to employers who have uh, fewer than 10 employees. Uh, so for a lot of small businesses that have fewer than 10 employees, you don't have these OSHA reporting requirements for uh, work-related illnesses and injuries. Uh, be beyond, if you have 10 or more employees, more than 10 employees, then, then you do have these OSHA reporting requirements for uh, work-related illnesses or injuries. You need to be aware of the, what you may consider is the problematic employee who's constantly complaining of, uh, you're not doing this, uh, you're not doing this and that with respect to safety, you need to increase safety measures and procedures here with respect to COVID-19. But you need to listen to the, those employees who are doing that, hear what they're saying, you know, you don't have to do everything that they're recommending or, or suggesting, but at least listen to them. Don't terminate them because they're complaining of, of that you're not doing enough in the workplace. Uh, their expectations may be higher than, than what is actually required or recommended by the CDC. Um, but you, you, you want to try to avoid uh, you know, terminating those employees because they're complaining of, of workplace safety issues because you're gonna have an increased risk of a claim that's filed for whistleblower protection or retaliation under OSHA or the equivalent state law. Also, if groups of employees are, you understand that they are speaking together and they are talking that the em employer or your business is not doing enough, they may have additional protections under the National Labor Relations Act, which allows employees to speak about working terms and conditions for their mutual aid and benefit. And if you are preventing that or stifling that, um, then, then you may, the employer may be found to violating the National Labor Relations Act. So again, if you have a problematic employee, generally speaking, the, the way to, you, you want to performance manage them out of, of, of the workplace and not because of their complaints of workplace uh, safety issues. That's, that's a no-no. Okay, if, what happens if my employee refuses to, to return to work? Can I terminate them? Generally, yes, if you have available work and the employee's just simply refusing to do it out of fear of returning to work. There are exceptions though. If there's objective evidence that the workplace poses a direct threat to the employee's safety and health, then you wanna think twice about terminating an employee who's afraid to come to work. They may be a vulnerable individual um, there might be clusters of employees who have been affected from the work site. And in that case, there may be a direct threat to their safety and health. And so you can't terminate an employee if those, th those conditions exist. Um, a reasonable accommodation may be required for vulnerable individuals. Uh, if, they're, if, they, if an elderly employee, 75 years old, 80 years old says, hey, I cannot come to work. I'm, I'm very you know, I, I'm immunodeficient or my wife is immunodeficient or my spouse is immunodeficient and I'm afraid to come to work. Um, I, I'm at risk of, of uh, complications of COVID-19. You'll want to work with them, talk with them about their condition and ask uh, what accommodation can be made before you terminate them for refusing to come to work. 
The last area I want to cover is the paid leave laws. This is very important because I see that uh, although you're taking the proper steps of maintaining a healthy workplace, employers can get into trouble here by not knowing what the requirements are for paid leave, both at the Arizona level and federal. I want to talk about the federal paid leave right now, though. Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act is, and the Emergency Family Medical Leave Expansion Act those are, those are laws that were uh, included within the Families First Coronavirus Response Act that was enacted, passed into law by Congress and signed by the president in late March of this year to address uh, issues with respect to paid leave. The effective period of that law is April 1st, 2020 to December 31st, 2020. So it's a short term unless it's extended by Congress. Um, it's a very short term uh, time period in which this paid leave is going to be available. So for emergency paid sick leave, employers are required to provide up to two weeks, 80 hours of paid sick leave for workers dealing with the effects of coronavirus. This is for full-time employees. I'm going to get into a little more detail in a second, but just a broad overview. That's emergency paid sick leave, up to two weeks of paid leave. Emergency Family and Medical Leave Act provides for 12 weeks of time off for employees caring for a child due to coronavirus related school and child care closures. That's the only reason You're, an employee needs to care for their child due to coronavirus related school and child care closures. The first two weeks are unpaid and the following 10 weeks are paid at two thirds an employee's regular rate of pay. The Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act amends the regular FMLA most times employers that are smaller, so fewer than 50 employees do not have to comply with FMLA, but all employers, including small, very small employers, have to comply with this provision of FMLA, which has been now amended. It's the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act. First thing you need to know is you need to make sure, if you haven't done it already, that you post the employee rights under these acts in a conspicuous place on, on your worksite premises. And if, and if you have employees that are working remotely, you need to email the employee rights to them to make sure that they have this. Otherwise, you get in trouble with the Department of Labor of not posting or providing the notice, which is required under the law. You can get the model notices available on the Department of Labor's website, and I listed the link here where you can get the model notice that's right here on the left side of the, of the screen. And then you can just email that to employees or, or you post that at the work site or do both. So which employers must comply with the EFMLA or EFMLEA and Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act? So employers with fewer than 500 employees in the United States and its ter territories, those are the employ employers that must provide such leave. Um, the reason why it, it doesn't apply to the large employers, at least the reason I've heard or it has been provided is because those larger companies often provide paid leave policies that are more generous than smaller employers that the smaller employers can uh, afford to do. Whether that make, makes uh, sense, I don't know, but it does apply to mostly small and medium-sized businesses. And those, as far as counting employees, it includes all full and part-time employees, employees on leave, temporary employees. It, doesn't not, it does not include independent contractors or workers in other countries. As far as employees that are covered under the emergency paid sick leave, all employees, are allowed to take this leave. Uh, is the emergency FMLA, any employee who has worked for a company for at least 30 days before requesting leave. So virtually all employees under that law as well, except for the recent hires that, were, you know, they are, there's a 30 day window where they cannot have the right to take paid leave under the laws if they've only been with the company less than 30 days. Now, employers of, of healthcare providers or emergency responders may elect to exclude uh, employees from coverage under the acts. You don't want the emergency responders and healthcare workers taking the leave when people need them. So they, they may uh, exclude such employees under those acts. I wanna talk about emergency FMLA only right now. The only reason to, to allow uh, this that employees have the right to take leave under this law is, is again, because they're caring for his or her child whose school or place of care is closed due to COVID-19. Generally, that's a minor child under 18, but it also may apply to children who are over 18 who have a disability. Now, there are six reasons 
for taking leave under the emergency paid sick leave. Okay, so now we're talking emergency paid sick leave, not emergency FMLA. There's six reasons under emergency paid sick leave, permissible reasons to, to use that leave. Uh, the, let's go through them briefly. The employee subject to a governmental quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. So this is if a state or county uh, has a has a order requiring that employee to stay home because of, they have COVID-19 or concerns about it. If they come in and show the order uh, or, or provide that, then they are able to take this COVID-19, uh, this uh, emergency paid sick leave. Reason number two, the employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine related to COVID-19. So this is not a governmental order, but the let's say an employee's physician says, um, you know, that they, this, this is a vulnerable individual. They cannot come to the work site and uh, they need to self-quarantine because of concerns. Um, this is a reason to provide the emergency paid sick leave. Reason three, the employee is experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and, and is seeking a medical diagnosis. So this, the employee is actively, you know, seeking a medical diagnosis. They've come down with, with the symptoms that are uh, similar to COVID-19. Uh, this is another reason to provide the leave. Reason four, the employee is, is caring for an individual who is being quarantined or self-quarantined. This is typically a, a person in the residence, a family member they're caring for or someone who is like family that they need to take care of. Uh, reason five, the employee is caring for a child whose school or, or place of care has been closed due, due to COVID-19 precautions. This is the same reason as the emergency FMLA leave, but this provide this can provide the first two weeks of that FMLA leave paid now and then the remaining 10 weeks it would be covered under the EFMLA. Reason six is it, the employees experiencing any other substantially similar conditions specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services in consultation with the Secretaries of Labor and Treasury. To my knowledge it, this has not reason six has not been specified yet there hasn't been any uh, uh, there hasn't been any announcements or alerts with respect to any other substantially similar condition that has been specified. So really at this point, we're dealing with reasons one through five, but you wanna keep abreast of the situation and there might be a time where there is a reason six. How much paid time does an employee receive? So a full-time employee may receive up to 80 hours of paid leave. A part-time employee may receive the number of hours that the employee works on an average over a two week period. So if that employee normally works 24 hours a week, uh, over a two week, uh, over a weekly period, then they'd be entitled to 50 hours of paid sick leave. For emergency FMLA, they only get 10 weeks of paid leave, but, but they get a total of 12 weeks of leave. So the first two weeks may be substituted, that unpaid portion may be substituted by emergency paid sick leave or other paid leave uh, that they may have. The rate of pay depends on the reason. Uh, of uh, leave to make things even more complicated, but let me go through it briefly so you get an understanding of what this is. Hi, Travis. It's a Sandy. We're going to move to questions uh, after okay. this. Thanks. Okay. I'm almost I'm almost done, but let's go ahead and go to questions. That's fine. Terrific. That was a great job. We really do appreciate it. Um, just so much information and uh, highly appreciate it. I think um, the first one might take a little bit. So let's go, uh, let's start from the bottom. Does the 80 hour sick leave requirement um, apply equally to full-time and part-time employees? Yeah, so uh, the 80 hours, no, I, and I, was, I think I just covered that slide. Basically uh, 80 hours is for full-time employees and then part-time you look at what they normally would work over a, over a two, two week period. And if you need to go back six months and you can see what that is, that's what, that's what you do to figure out, uh, you know, what that would be. So like if they were 25 hours, again, over two week per week, over two week period, they'd be entitled to uh, 50 hours of paid sick leave. Thank you. And then should employers have employees returning to work in the office sign a waiver of some sort? I've gotten that question before too. So um, you can't, employers can't generally protect themselves through a waiver by employees, right? So under Arizona law, you, employers are generally protected by workers' compensation, which is a no-fault system, meaning that uh, employees can't generally sue their employers for neg negligence. So if, if from, you know, failure to maintain a healthy work site, they can't normally sue. Now OSHA will come in and, and assist those em employees or, um, uh, or, or maybe workers' comp, there might be issues, but uh, as far as waivers, 
uh, it, protecting that employee employee relationship that's not something that um, in fact you, you can't you can't waive certain responsibilities right employees can't say uh, employers can't require that so um, you know that's not something that is recommended and it's actually maybe unlawful okay, thank you mm -hmm. um, you uh, mentioned a prolonged period previously in the presentation define what prolonged period of time is is being uh, within six feet of sporadic on a sporadic basis considered prolonged so before we get to that question, I want to I want to talk real quickly about the waiver question. I just want to add one more thing. You can require customers to sign waivers, and if you're doing something with a, a business agreement with a customer or a vendor, as part of that agreement, you can insert language providing a waiver of with respect to COVID-19 that they are going to do business with you, and, that, and there might be some risk of exposure, and they're waiving that. So I was just talking about employer-employee relationship. Perfect. Okay, let's go on to the next the question. You talked about prolonged period of time. Um, I, I'm not aware uh, right now of what exactly that means. I, th I think the CDC probably does have uh, uh, more guidance with respect to what that means. Uh, but as close contact, they do say, CDC does say that's within six feet of someone. For a prolonged period of time, I think you need to kind of understand that might be, uh, you know, more than a minute, more than five minutes, you know, whatever it, it might be. If you're in a meeting with someone for 30 minutes and you're within six feet of that person, that's, that's probably a prolonged period of time. Thank you. Um, another question, does the disposal of tissues require a sealed container to protect from spread? Um, you know, I, I, you'd have to look for the CDC guidance on that again, and maybe the Maricopa County uh, Health Department. Uh, I'm not aware of a, a requirement of, of absolutely sealed. I mean, I think it's a good practice to have something where it has a, a container that has a, maybe a flap that comes down or something, a cover that's on top of it. Uh, but I'm not aware of that being an absolute requirement. Okay, and then if you could read that top question from David, I'll uh, address this next one really quick while you're reading that. Let's see. Um, I, I'm not sure. I don't see how do I get to it. Could this presentation? Sorry, could this presentation be available in paper format? We do have the presentation. Uh, it will be posted up on the website. Uh, Mark has given the link. If you can take a look at that link and give us about an hour or two after the presentation, and we'll have both the video and the presentation up on the site. Okay, so you're talking about the question from David Ga uh, David Graff. Yes. Okay, let me let me read real quick. Uh oh, the the question disappeared before I finished reading it. Let's see. All right, is there is there any way you can read it to me or find it again? Um, I, it, it's basically generally asking. Um, with regards to webcams in the office, um, is the company more liable um, with video in the, in the uh, environment of webcams and working at home? You mean if an employee is working remotely? Yeah, working remotely with webcams. Well, I mean, I don't, I mean, I, I'm not sure I really understand the question. I mean, obviously, uh, employer, if, if they're working in the office, uh, you know, and, and the employer's not doing enough to create social distancing, uh, of course, there might be some liability there. But if an employee's working remotely, uh, it, 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 un, generally speaking, employers need, need to make sure that the workplace at the employee's home, they need to ask questions where they have a proper workplace, those type of things. Because if an employee is injured or comes down with some illness at home, there might be some type of liability, but the employer can't really control if there's a family member or something of the employee that, that has COVID-19. They can't help, you know, stop the spread with, with regard to that. So that, but, but just generally speaking, there is some, um, some liability uh, of, of if employees are requiring all employees to work from home and work remotely, that there uh, is some exposure potentially with respect to on the job injuries. Um, there's a question here uh, from Andy. Uh, what are employees' responsibilities for employees entering customer workspace, such as a hotel room? Uh, read the question one more time. Uh, what are employers' responsibilities for employees entering customer workspace, such as a hotel room? Okay. All right, so that, that's a great question. I mean, I, again, I think employers have the general duty to maintain that their workspaces, right? And they can provide recommendation to 
employees uh, how to, if they're offsite and going other places, um, to, to maybe create social distance where, where they can. Um, if they don't feel comfortable entering certain, uh, you know, third party places um, that they shouldn't do so, uh, employers should limit travel and limit interactions for, for a while until we can get COVID-19 under, under better control. Um, it, to the extent that business travel or those type going to a hotel, for instance, unless it's necessary to the business, employers should really consider limiting such, such, such trips and, and things like that to third party places because, again, they, there might be some liability if the, the, um, if, if the employee is infected with COVID-19 by visiting a, a situation. Now, employees, though, they have to prove that they were, uh, that they were infected by COVID-19 during their work place or during their work hours or during their work um, activities. And that's going to be difficult for employees to do. Uh, but, but they may be able to do that if there's no other explanation. Well, terrific. Travis, thank you so much. What a valuable session. Um, incredible information that you're providing. Again, this will be posted up on ecommerce.com. Small Business Bootcamp. Take a look at that website um, and that link that's been posted here. We're going to leave this open for other uh, chat information. If you have any other topics that you're interested in, please post them up. Again, Travis, fantastic stuff. Thank you so much for participating and presenting today. Okay, and, and the last thing I say is I have my contact information on the last slide. So if you post it, if it, those in the tenants need to contact me or they want legal counsel, they can do so. Uh, we'd have to run conflicts. And, and, and uh, but if, if, if you need help with any assistance, may, or you have doubts, make sure you contact legal counsel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Travis. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day.